Okay, you're set. Okay, I understand. Okay, and we're gonna go into Facebook. Okay, again. All right. Okay. Are we live? What's going on? Not yet. I'll let you know. It's I'm not cool. there yet. It says live in my thing. Cool. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, I'm gonna introduce you and then you're gonna begin, okay? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Hi guys, uh, this is uh, Levitt and Hannah, and uh, today we're having a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guest and uh, on this live with you guys, and her name is Nini Castle. Um, she has a wonderful practice, she's going to tell us all about it, so I'm going to go now, and uh, here she is. So, um, bye guys, take care, enjoy. Hey everybody, so it's really nice to meet all of you. I love how this thing, it says, thank you Hashem. I, I, I love that so much. It's like so much the core of everything that we do <clears throat> and everything who we are. And I couldn't have done this without the help of Hashem. And you know, we all know that it's foundational, but sometimes we just need that little reminder of who's in charge, who helps us get where we need to go and where we're going. So I just, just looking at the icon that says, thank you Hashem, wanted before I even begin, just really send gratitude to Hashem send gratitude to everyone that helped me to be here today, to all the people that I met that directed me here. You know who you are, maybe not, but <clears throat> anyways, just giving everyone that gratitude and space. So, okay, a little bit about me. I am actually a multidimensional clairvoyant healer and an intuitive transformational coach. And a lot of people say, wait, clairvoyant, how is that congruent with Judaism, like, isn't that like psychic? Isn't that maybe witchcraft? Can you, what, what's, what's clairvoyant? So I just want to explain something. Clairvoyance is the ability to just see things that are more tapped into intuition. Clairaudience is to hear them. Claircognizant is to feel them in our body. Telepathic is mind to mind. I actually have all of them and I was born with this. So it doesn't mean that I'm doing anything that's playing with any kind of magic. What it means is that I'm tapped into intuition and my five senses, you know, we physically see and hear and smell and touch and taste. I have it to a very intuitive ability where I can see, hear, touch, taste, smell things beyond the, uh, what we would physically see. And just a little bit about that is it talks a lot about in, in science. And yes, I, I'm very much a scientist as much as I am into spirituality. Science would explain this. These are things that are not necessarily seen with our eyes, but the electromagnetic spectrum will pick that up. So temperature, for example, is called infrared. It's felt with our bodies, but it's not seen with our eyes. Nevertheless, it's still very much there, even though we don't see it. So with the clairvoyant or clairaudient, the quote unquote psychic abilities, these things are there. 
we just don't always see them because we're walking around with a human ego, which is very notorious for blinding our vision. So just a little bit of explanation of what that's all about when I say clairvoyance. So there is no fortune telling, there's no magic tricks. Anyone who says they can tell you the fortune would be telling you a lie. And I say that because after the destruction of the second temple, the Beis Amikdash, the Navua was taken from us. So anyone who claims that they can tell you the future, that is not the truth. So just a little disclaimer there. Anyways, so a little bit about my story is, like I said, I was born with these abilities and I always knew as a child, I knew that there was more than what met the eyes. And I'm sure a lot of people have said this speech, you've heard this you know, entrepreneurial speech of I knew there was more and I had to follow my passion. And that's basically what it was. I had a very unusual experience while the physical things that happened to me in childhood were normal. The experiences I had were very unusual. And one of the earliest ones was that when I was five years old, I brought home a math textbook from school. And I sat down and over two afternoons, I completed this math textbook start to finish. And it was like, don't you want to go out and play? And I'm like, no, no, I want to do, I mean, I want to go out and play, but I want to do this. I want to do this. So I had fascination with the way things worked as far as spirituality, the numbers, the science. And even as I got to be a little bit older, the history. And as I grew up, there was a lot of things that I was sort of like, okay, this is incongruent. Like, how could you claim that, uh, like, for example, a lot of people would say things like, you know, God wants us to afflict our souls and to be in pain and to suffer and sacrifice. And I was just like, how could this be true? I, it doesn't make sense because God created food. And yes, we need to eat, but he created food that tastes good. Why would God create a food that is desirable if he doesn't want us to enjoy it? So I knew there had to be more. And I went through life tapped into these senses, seeing things that I knew other people did not see. So I kept it quiet or relatively quiet for a while. It just manifested itself in unusual behaviors and unusual fascinations to things in life. As a teenager, I had um, also I'll say clairvoyant instructions that I needed to start taking care of my physical body. Now, I was always very athletic. I was very into like exercise and sports and moving. But when it came to nutrition, I knew nothing about it. My version of vegetables was French fries and ketchup. I, if, if there was like one hint of any kind of greenery minus spinach, which I did like, I know it's kind of unusual in my food. I was like, yuck, it's been contaminated. Yeah. So it was like, and then I had gotten this message. Okay. You got to start taking care of yourself. And I was like, I don't even know where to start. I mean, yes, I'm fascinated with science. So I know the science of things, but nutrition, I don't know the first thing. So I went all in. I just said, well, you got to start somewhere. And I started to just experiment and I learned to like the vegetables and I found ways in the beginning to eat them that was easier. So I didn't like raw vegetables. And for those of you out there who are struggling with food and finding healthy options, you know, I'm, I'm with you. Like I, I, I didn't have the weight issues, God bless that, but I struggled with healthy options. And I taught myself how to really love the process of eating healthy by beginning with, you know, I don't like vegetables. Let me just own where I'm at. I can't pretend I like them, but you know, I like vegetable soup and I don't like the vegetables in the soup, but I like the flavor they lent. So in the beginning I was making vegetable soups and I wouldn't eat the vegetables, but I at least ate the broth where the vegetables were cooked. And then slowly I would add vegetables into the soup and just like little baby steps one after another. And as the years went on, I, I added more exercise to my routine. I got a membership at the gym in addition to uh, gymnastics, bike riding and dance, which I did on my own. And I just built this whole routine that was just serving my soul. And I noticed as I started to grow, my, my level of understanding for Hashem's world, Torah knowledge, began to really exponentially increase. And I also was tapping into my gift as a healer, because at the same time this was happening, I was aware of my clairvoyant abilities and I started to actually come forth with it. I stopped hiding it. I started telling people what I saw. <clears throat> needless to say, it was a little bit rocky how it was received. People were like, 
you know, I believe you that you're sensitive, but how do we know this is not woohoo? How do we know this is incongruence with the Torah? And I started using it to prove Hashem. I mean, Hashem doesn't need our proof, but I started saying, you know something? This actually doesn't go connect Hashem. If you actually look, the for our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they use things like astrology. The Malbim talks about it. They use things. Avraham used the stars. They all use these things. So why are they forbidden? Because people made the mistake of worshiping the stars as opposed to using it as a tool to understand Hashem. So these things are tools to understand Hashem that people kind of got a little lost along the way. So it became a control all, everything is us ordeal. So for me to really research, I had to understand what's usr and what isn't. And a lot of things that really aren't usr were labeled as usr. So that made me very, very strong in my knowledge of what is actually the halacha, what is a humra, what got lost along the way, what is based in fear and scarcity, and what do we actually know is MS. And I was very into gematria, so I would look for the signs within the numbers. What does it mean? So just a fun one is that the, the word MS, this might be known to some of you, equals 441. Now, the thing with MS, it, ha it has a madraga, a madrega, a level of nine. Nine is the truth. And the cool thing is any multiple of nine, no matter how you arrange the numbers, if you add them together, always will be nine. So what I mean is nine, 18, 27, 36, 45, 54, 63, 72, 81. You add those numbers together. Eight plus one is nine. Two plus seven is nine. Three plus six is nine. 45, four plus six plus nine, 108. One plus zero plus eight is nine. It always leads you back to the truth. So the word MS equals 441. Guess what? Four plus four plus one equals nine. So pretty fun stuff. I started to delve into that in tandem with getting into my physical body and taking care of myself I and creating a lifestyle that was just unbelievably powerful. As I started to focus more on self-care and self-love and self-growth, I realized I cannot serve another human being if I'm not feeling good in my body. And a lot of people heard that and they were like, well, what do you mean? Don't you have to get like a job? You have to get a job. Your, your job is to put yourself last, last while you serve everybody else. And I said, listen, you cannot serve out of an empty cleat. God, Hashem wants to pour his love into you. And basically we're saying, oh, no, no, put me last. Hashem, my hands are so filled with all these problems. I don't have room for your abundance. And we're basically giving our birth right away. And that was like something very, very foundational to me. So after going to many very unpleasant jobs where I was unhappy and in some very bullied, very abused, I, I quit my jobs. Every entrepreneur story, I quit my jobs. I didn't have a job. I didn't know where it was going to come from. And I took a leap of faith. I said, I got to start somewhere. And I can't slave my life away for an employer who decides my worth, decides that because I don't work on Shabbos, even though I work six other days, they're going to lower my salary again. They already lowered it once. And decides my time schedule, decides when I get a lunch break, how long my lunch break is, and decides everything else. I don't give that away to an employer. I choose these things. Hashem gave me the birthright. Hashem gave each and every human being what is known as freedom of choice. And here we are giving it away to somebody else. It's the ultimate embarrassment, the ultimate busha. God gives us a gift and we're just saying, okay, screw you, God. I'm going to go give it to somebody else now. I said, I can't do that. It's so incongruent with everything we're here to be and everything we're here to do and embody. I need to be my full self and be expressed as my full self because Hashem if I try to be somebody else, you created them. I need to be me. There's no other Nini Castle. That's my job. So like I said, I quit my job and I took the leap of faith. And I said, I have no idea where I'm going, but I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. And believe me, it was a leap of faith because there were days where it was like, I look at my account and it's like, I barely had enough to like go shopping that week. Like, where is it going to come from? Oh my God. And it was scary. It was really scary, but I remember I hit a very big low at some point and I, I, I cried bitterly. And I'm not a crier, people. I am not a crier. And I said, Hashem, if you promise me to give me a certain you know, base amount of money of income, I'll never complain about my bills. I'll pay it and I'll do what it is I need to do. But if I don't have that base, I can't. Please, please help me. And I had felt on a clairvoyant level, this sort of feedback that said command received. And I found that 
things didn't turn around immediately. I hit a few very bad slumps and, it, you know, things get worse before they get better. You know, the night is always darkest before dawn. I hit a very, very big low right before my 31st birthday. It was so low. I was like literally scared out of my mind, out of my wit's end of what was going to happen. And it was just my birthdays in the summer. Again, just in prayer, I was so scared what it's going to be. I do not know how I'm going to make it through tomorrow. And it was the day before my birthday, no, two days before my birthday, I wanted to have a happy birthday and I just didn't know what was going to happen. So I decided on my birthday, I'm just going to celebrate no matter what. And I did. And it was a beautiful day. And then a few weeks later, this was, and I'll tell you, it was Som Gedalia. So that was in early October that year. So it was maybe six or so weeks after my birthday. I received a client, I guess you can say I got a client for my healing work. And all of a sudden, everything started to change. She used my services, she referred me, and she used me regularly. And one thing led to another where I was able to give out of my heart and soul. And on Som Gedalia that day alone, I went from being basically broke to almost having $1,000 just on what had happened. And I said, oh my God, oh my God. So I knew Hashem had answered my tefillos. And I said, it's this time for me to really play full out, be all in, in who I meant to be in this world and help people and serve people from a place of love and abundance and total, total just appreciation and compassion. And that's what I said I'll do. I said, I had started it before, but I said, I'm going all in. And, you know, things always go up and down. I had a few more low points along the way, some other areas where I thought I had lost everything again. And then again, it was Pesach time. The day after Pesach, I was wondering, where's it going to come from? And I was scrolling through Facebook and you know, they have those ads. And there was one ad that said, you want to become a health coach? And I was like, okay, what's this? And I clicked it and I filled it out. And I figured if this is legit, they'll call me. If not, they won't. The next morning I got a phone call and I wasn't able to talk at the time. So I said to them, could you call me back a little bit later? And again, if it was a scam, they would not have called me back. But nope, they called me back. We made a time and I enrolled for the program pretty much that day. And I got started with coaching school. So in addition to my clairvoyance services as a healer and a reader and someone who does the intuitive work, I was now gonna get health coaching work. And everything that I had gone through in the past since I was a teenager with my journey around health and food and living healthy was all validated in this health coaching course. I had never seen it anywhere. Everything that I had embodied without ever going to school was validated in this course. And I was like, whoa. So then I went on to mastery of coaches and healers afterwards to get into the belief and deeper identity work. And again, I kept practicing as a, as a healer because the healing work is what was very inherent for me. And doing the healing work in tandem with the coaching was great because the healing, the mistake I had made was I was rescuing people out of their misery. I would come into a healing, I'd activate everything, I'd rescue them from their trouble. But the problem is you take someone out of the, out of the trouble, but you don't teach them how to help themselves. And in coaching school, I got to learn, I can teach you how to help yourself. And the, just the, the, marriage of both of those both of those things was so important to me because as a healer I don't want to enable a poor habit by just rescuing you and then you not knowing where you're going afterwards I want to teach you how to have this work for yourself so let's fast forward a little bit again I finished the course for mastery of coaches and healers in March of 2020 the notorious date March of 2020 everyone knows what happened to the world then and I remember thinking for a brief moment, hmm, I finished this course. I wonder what's going to open up for me next. So in the interim, COVID happened. And as everything was shutting down, I started to feel very frustrated. It's like, oh my gosh, what's happening to the world? I'm a peaceful person. Why is everything going crazy? You know, that feeling of why am I getting punished for something I didn't do? All that victimization is coming up. And in the midst of it, I heard a clear audience call. This was so crystal clear. It was, quote, 
do not fear, and I promise you, it will be okay, end quote. And I felt it in my entire body. That was God speaking right to me. Now, I'm not going to sit there and say it was Nivua. It wasn't, but you know, you know what I mean. I heard it so clearly. And what it meant was, when it says, do not fear, and I promise it'll be okay, it doesn't mean close my eyes, make it disappear, and I'm going to just go outside and not follow any of the safety guidelines, or I'm going to be silly and foolish, and I'll be fine. What it means is, do not subjugate yourself to the lies of fear and scarcity. Do not subjugate yourself to the, I guess, klipa, the, ability, the inability to see. We know without a fraction of a doubt Hashem created this world. Don't let the illusions fool us into thinking that it's not the truth. If Hashem created us in the world, he did not put us here to lead us off a cliff. He did not. And when it says do not fear, it means don't be afraid. You still need to take your precautions. We still needed to do and follow the, the guidelines of safety and make sure that we're keeping safe to our fellow brothers and sisters, of course. It just means don't get lost in the, in the lies of scarcity and fear. And I took that very seriously. So I went out and I said, you know what? I do an exercise routine every single day and the gym has now been shut down. I wanna do my routine and I'll say it out. I do a six to seven hour routine every day, minus Shabbos, of course. Shabbos is its own thing, but people think, are you nuts? Six to seven hours of exercise? Are you out of your mind? What time do you wake up? Yeah, three o'clock in the morning, six days a week. And it's like, are you serious? Are you sure you're not addicted? No, I'm serious and I'm sure. And with the gym being closed, it gets a little challenging. When something is non-negotiable, you do it anyways. And I did not miss a day. The gym was closed for, I believe it was 99 days. I did not miss one day of my six hour routine. I did it every day, non-negotiable. And even if that meant going out when it was, you know, very, very cold outside, I wanted this routine. It was important to me. I went and did it. I made it happen. And that taught me something very important. When you want something, you make it happen. So at the same time that everything was shutting down, the next growth edge came to me. I was invited to join a platform. And now this is not a Jewish platform, but it was a powerful platform that if you are fully self-responsible to take your business. Now I'm an artist and a healer, not a businesswoman, but take your business in your hand and you wanna create automation, you wanna monetize who you are, you wanna learn personal branding and you wanna get paid to be in your genius, welcome aboard. I went into this and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? It's too good to be, it's like, this is like too good to be true, right? And I was a little bit under the false impression of the automation of this beautiful platform will do it for me. So it's just as, you know, it's just like saying, I don't have to solve all your problems. I can create residual income. I can actually get paid to do what I want because I have so much automation in place. It's set up, it's doing the work for me, which is a very amazing system. But here's the thing. I sort of was like, okay, fine. It'll happen for me and I don't have to do anything. And let me tell you, that is not true. So I've been spending these past almost year working on cultivating a business. I have, I have an amazing team of entrepreneurs, healers, leaders, visionaries, heart-centered human beings who are willing to teach me all the skills I need to put my best self forward. And when I say best self, I don't just mean the pretty marks, the pretty parts that I want people to see. I mean the vulnerable parts that we all try to hide behind the rug. That gets to come out and speak too. The full authentic self gets to come forth. You get to be honest because think about it in a marriage. If you're going on a shidduch and you're only being on your super best behavior and the person that says yes to you sees you being perfectly well behaved all the time, that's the version of yourself that he's going to expect to see day out and day out, day in and day out. So if you're not always perfectly well behaved, there's going to be a bit of a disappointment. So I'm not saying you have to sit there and be a jerk, but you need to be fully authentic in who you are. And if you're not being fully authentic in your business, you're not going to find customers, clients that can love, know, and trust you. And I've been diving deep into that so that I can get my message out as a healer because we all know, we all know the world needs healers, heart-centered, loving, caring healers to spread the word of God. I tell people, I'm a light worker that works for God. I work for God. I'm on his salary. I'm on his time schedule. I'm on his, 
his, his, his benefits, everything. But I can't do that if no one can see me, if I'm not playing full out in my business. So this provided me an incredible opportunity where not only do I have this automation, this education, and we also partner with a high ticket offer. So again, me, I'm so not the salesperson type. When I saw this, I'm like, well, if it takes the same amount of effort to sell a low ticket item, like let's say a box of uh, beauty products or whatever, I'm not saying, when I say low ticket, I don't mean low value that it's a, it's a, it's a stupid thing. I mean, it's just not an expensive thing. But it takes the same amount of effort to sell a low ticket item than it does a high ticket item. Same effort. You still have to make the sale. And I said, why don't I get paid to do that? So I, I don't need to sell as many, you can sell fewer items. But the item has such incredible value for people's health. Everything that I'm passionate about, their health, their lifestyle, you know, sustainable living, good for the planet, good for the body, good for the soul. Just, and then you also have the automation in place of residual income and an incredible community that is there to support you unconditionally through and through. I had never had such, a, such an experience in my life. It was amazing. So that is what a little bit about me. And I'm so on the journey. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still, I'm still playing. And you know, as, as long as we're alive, we're always going to keep playing. And that's the thing. So I want to speak into the idea of what it means to, I, I kind of got to it before, what it means to <clears throat> be the full self and not buy into the lies of scarcity and fear. So we have a little no, a knowledge here that Hashem is ain't old milbado and there's no such thing as an anti-God. No such thing. But at the same time, we have a human ego and psychologists call that ego a sense of self, which is a healthy thing. It's an opinion. It's our sense in, in, in the universe and the space-time continuum, which is important. But at the same time, what the ego does, it's a great statistician and it likes to stir the pot. The ego will sit there and take the things that it's seen in the past. Like if it's seen in the past that you fell down and got hurt, it puts that picture in front of your eyes and says, well, you can't ever do that again because you might fall and get hurt. And you keep telling yourself the story subliminally and you come to believe it and fear it. But to believe and fear that type of thing of total prediction is to, is to deny the existence of God. Because basically what you're doing is you're testifying, well, if that's true, then there is a force counter to God of evil, which balances God out. Because if, if that's true, that fear and scarcity has that kind of power and ego has the power to to doom you that you're going to forever be stuck in this rut, you're basically saying, I don't believe in Hashem, or I want to believe in Hashem, but I can't because there's this counter force that's going to keep me stuck forever. What we do is we get to lean into the idea of we can expand to the unknown, the things that we don't see. So last time I fell down when I went up the stairs, but I'm going to go up those stairs again because I'm open to the possibility that I won't fall this time if I'm careful. Hashem rules the world. Hashem calls the shots. There's nothing anti-God. Even the ego and the Yetzirah and all the lies and the scarcity, Hashem gave space for that when he created a physical world. So Hashem doesn't expect us to get it perfect. Hashem does not expect us to get the right answer. He knows we're going to flub it up. That's part of the DNA of humanhood. What Hashem wants is what's the most delicious is when in spite of our human ego, in spite of our fear, in spite of the human experience that we're not tall enough to see to, to the other side yet, we still choose to worship Hashem and to follow his will. In spite of all the doubt and scarcity, it says, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. We say, I don't see the way, but I know Hashem would never bring me here to lead me off a cliff. He would never do that. And if I am going to go off a cliff, he would give me a parachute. He's not going to let that happen. I trust. That is what the tachon is. It's that trust. The amuna is knowing. It's the knowledge, the faith. I know Hashem exists, but the tachon is actually taking the action and trusting that Hashem is there and is leading you. And that is the foundational principle. It's my work as a healer, as a coach, and as now someone who's stepping into the business and who is using the automation in a heart-centered way so that I can have these things work for me. The more I can solve problems for people, the more I can help people. And the thing is being human, I'm only one person. I'm only one person. I can only help so many people. 
when I can plug people into an automated system that can help you learn to solve your own problems, think of it like a GPS. You know, I am only one person. I can only give the roadmap to so many people because of physical limitations. So I'll say, okay, you know, I can't tell every single person the roadmap, but I'm going to give you guys a GPS. All you got to do is plug and play, literally. But the one thing you have to remember is that the GPS is not going to teleport you there. You still have to travel and make the effort. So that's where it's at. Traveling in the direction of God, making the effort, knowing that God has directed this GPS divinely for you. And it's my pleasure and my honor to be of service. So it was really, really wonderful to meet everyone here today. I wish everyone the most beautiful of evenings and wherever you are in the world, take care and thank you so, so much. Bye-bye. So I hope you liked the interview. We're uh, incredibly happy to have had uh, Nini and uh, with us, she's an amazing person and uh, Jewish Poshity Magazine is so happy that she was able to, you know, give us her time. And so that's it guys. Um, hope that you have a wonderful day. And uh, there will be a, more interviews. Actually, it's just, uh, she, I just wanted her to talk about, you know, why she does in her practice. And so we're gonna be having um, interviews and uh, many wonderful things that's coming up. And this new, this new journey for Posh, which is Posh interviews and, and lives uh, with different wonderful people. So that's about it, guys. I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day. So take care, everybody. Bye.